Innuendo, Book 5 of the Todd Mills Mystery Series. Author, R.D. Zimmerman. Publisher, Scribble Pub Press. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 10. It was just after 7 when Todd sensed Rollins forcing himself out of bed, then back into the shower, and eventually back into his clothes. Through a haze of sleep, Todd wondered why Rollins had bothered coming home at all. But of course, it wasn't that unusual. When a murder investigation was just cranking up, Rollins grabbed sleep whenever and however he could. With each moment, Todd woke up more and more, quite quickly so. But he didn't call out to Rollins, nor did he even flinch. Rather, he just lay there, completely still, until he was absolutely positive that Rollins was out the door. He didn't get up because he didn't want to talk to Rollins, and he didn't want to talk to him because he simply didn't know what to say. I love you. I hate you. Once he heard the front door open and shut, Don was pulled out of bed by the rich smell of coffee, the lure of which he could rarely resist. He slipped on his dark maroon terry cloth bathrobe and headed down the hall to the kitchen, where he saw not only the red light of their coffee maker still burning, but his favorite mug, a tall, thin, black and white one with a large handle, which Rollins had set up for Todd, for Todd's perusal. Rollins had also left today's issue of the Star Tribune on the middle of the counter, and he'd fed the cat. Yes, thought Todd as he surveyed the scene of seemingly domestic bliss. It certainly looked like just another day. Good morning, girlfriend, said Todd, when the cat looked up from her kibbles. As he poured himself his first cup of coffee, he realized that he felt, well, numb, his insides heavy and his limbs weak. He wasn't much interested in the idea of breakfast, actually. The thought of going back to bed sounded best of all. Okay, Todd, he told himself, face it. You're depressed. Carrying his coffee, he slowly made his way back down the hall through the bedroom and into the bathroom. He reached into the shower stall, turned on the water, then slipped off his robe. Mug in hand, he stepped into the shower and just stood there as the hot water pounded on his back. Shit, he wondered, taking a sip of coffee. What was this all about? And what the hell was going to become of them, Rollins and him? This couldn't be the beginning of the end, could it? Unfortunately, the only thing he was sure of was that he couldn't lose control of the story of Andrew Lyman's murder, which meant that he couldn't stay in the shower as long as he was tempted, nor could he mope around the apartment or lounge on the balcony and stare out at the lake or crawl back into bed and doze away the morning. He simply didn't dare. It was approaching 8 o'clock, and WLAK's daily editorial meeting started in just over 40 minutes, with last night's murder surely at the top of the agenda. Forcing himself to move, he grabbed the pile of articles on Tim Chase from the dining room table, stuffed them into his briefcase, and was out the front door. His second cup of coffee in hand. Rarely did it take more than 20 minutes to get anywhere in the Twin Cities. This morning, it took him just over 15 to traverse the ribbon of freeways and flat landscape to reach suburban Golden Valley in WLAK, a squat, mostly concrete structure that looked more like a war bunker than a successful television station. Immediately to the rear of the building were a dozen or so satellite dishes and a parking lot filled with a fleet of trucks and vans and EMG vehicles, all emblazoned with WLAK's logo. Using his ID card to enter the rear glass doors, Todd bypassed the crowded and busy newsroom to his right, headed down a wide, dimly lit corridor, lined with awards and photographs, and turned into a large conference room. Their yellow legal pads and morning coffee before them, a dozen people sat around a dark wooden table in the middle of the room. It began this way every day at WLAK. At 8.30 every morning, the news director, the 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. producers, the executive producer, the scattering of reporters, and the crew from the assignment desk, including the manager, the editor, and a couple of assistants all filed into this room. First on the agenda would be feedback from the previous few days, stories. Then those who had been up since the crack of dawn, reading any and all newspapers, studying the wire services, and taking as many calls as came in, would present a slew of story ideals. Next, the general tug would begin as they hashed out what would be reported as the day's most compelling news. Who was to handle it, and exactly how it would be covered. 
If you didn't get ownership of a story right here, I knew only too well there was no telling which way an idea would go. That was exactly why Todd was here. Some of the things these people came up with were absolutely nuts, particularly when it came to homosexuals and murders. Rather than taking a place at the table, Todd leaned against one wall, ready to pounce on the Andrew Lyman story, determined to claim it as his own. He stood silent, half listening as the news director, Tom Bosch, opened the meeting and covered the usual items as they discussed the ongoing saga of whether the omnipotent MN Dot, the Minnesota Department of Transportation, was going to persevere in building a huge bridge over the St. Croix River. Todd decided on the angle he was going to take for his own story and just how he'd pitch it. The federal judge assigned to this bridge thing will be announcing her decision just after lunch, said Bosch, a burly guy with brownish hair and big round shoulders. Any of you reporters want to pick it up? Carol Wyman's hand immediately shot up. Yeah, I'll take it. My parents have a cabin on the St. Croix, so I'm quite interested in this. Fine, it's yours. Just remember I want equal coverage of the issue. Men dots all worried about traffic congestion and the Department of Natural Resources is concerned about the quality of a national scenic waterway. I'd like to get something in there about the bridge encouraging urban sprawl, which it certainly would do, said the attractive slim reporter. Her brunette here clipped short. I mean, if they build a four-lane bridge from Minnesota to Wisconsin, you can bet the subdivisions are going to sprout like weeds over there. And the executive producer, Bill Summers, a loyally-looking type with silver hair, looked up and coolly said, Just keep it even. So what are we talking here? asked Steve Carlson, the assignment editor, who figured prominently in all these meetings. A 60-second package? No. We covered this one pretty extensively about two months ago, said Bosch. I think a 30-second live report, just about the judge's decision, would be enough. How about I do it from Stillwater, suggested Carol. We can get a downstream shot of the river. Fine. Okay, it's a go, said Carlson, writing it down. A 30-second live shot from Stillwater. We're talking for both the five and six, right? Right. Looking up at Todd, Tom Bosch said, now, what about this kid who was killed last night? Watch the story there. Was or wasn't he gay? Todd, who had correctly assumed the story would come up on the early side of the meeting, stepped away from the wall and said, I couldn't report on it any more directly last night because the police haven't released it. But Andrew Lyman, the kid who was killed, was most definitely gay. That a factor in the murder? I'm pretty sure it was. He was found in bed at 8.30 in the evening with his throat slit. From what I was told by one of the homicide investigators, chances are he just had sex with someone, said Todd, knowing that this was it, his pitch to obtain complete control of the story. Andrew was a runaway, and he grew up on a farm somewhere out state. I think it was in western Minnesota, actually. From what I understand, his parents found out he was gay and kicked him out. I met him at the Domain of Queers, the Gay Lesbian Youth Center, where I gave a talk. Did you know him well? asked Summers, scrutinizing him. He was asking Todd knew if it was going to be a conflict, which of course it would be for a host of different reasons. No, replied Todd. I met him just a couple of times, but that's enough, of course, for me to be able to put a personal angle on this thing. Bush said, So, we got a gay murderer on our hands. Is that how you want to come at it? Absolutely not. First of all, I think just about every other station is going to use that tag. Second, I want to give the story more depth. If, for no other reason than it raises some very complex questions. I want to start out by talking about a young, healthy kid who happened to be gay. I want to talk about a kid who was lost and lucky. A kid whose parents threw him out because of his sexuality. And I want to work this in with the domain of queers and how they're trying to provide a sense of place and direction for kids with poor self-esteem and nowhere to go. Carlson always wanted to keep things focused on who was doing what and when. Asked, what are you thinking? A package at five? No, Todd wanted the big one. He wanted this 6 p.m., all of this, though it was simply a matter of negotiation. No. I'm not sure I can be ready by then. 
I want to get as much from the police as possible, and I want to try and dig up something on the parents, too. The more time I have, the better. Then, how about a, a Vosat at five? Perfect, he thought. He could easily do one for the five o'clock, which would, in turn, give him exposure on both evening shows. Sure, he replied. Then I can front a package at six. Okay, said Tom Bush, looking around the room. Then let makes this our lead story on both the five and six. Do we agree? Sure, replied Carlson. Bill Summers nodded, which prompted a few more heads to go up and down, and then it was all set. Todd's work for the day was cast in stone. As they launched into a discussion about the proposed merger of two area banks and how it should be covered, Todd grabbed his briefcase and ducked out. In the hallway, he passed several reporters just now heading into the meeting, and then he turned into the newsroom. It was a large space filled with cubicles and dominated by the assignment desk, which was elevated and looked out over everything, functioning much like flight control. Only a handful of producers were at their desk. Some hammered away at keyboards, a couple yammering on the phone, as producers, of course, were wont to do. Todd passed a dark hallway of glass edit booths, wound his way around and turned into his glass-walled office. As always, the first thing he did was hit a couple of keys on the computer and check his email. There was not much of significance. Notification of a joint birthday party for four co-workers at five. This afternoon, a message from one of the producers that she'd submitted one of Todd's pieces for an Emmy. And a staff-wide notice about vacation procedure. He then picked up his phone and listened to his voicemail, finding that three tip callers had phoned in it last night to tell him about the murder, then someone else had phoned this morning from one of the local gay organizations wondering if Todd had any more information. The last call was from a man asking if Todd knew anything about a recall on blue cheese. There was nothing about Rollins, which Todd didn't know how to take. While he worked almost exclusively with Bradley, whom he considered to be their best photographer, not to mention the easiest and most flexible. Todd didn't have his own researcher, producer, last month. The news director, Tom Bosch, had told him he could have such a person, but Todd had been, and still was, reticent. Perhaps he was being both foolish and selfish, but he didn't want to be tied down, just as he didn't want to be responsible for filling another person's day. In the past, when he'd needed either research assistance or a producer, he'd always simply commandeered someone. It was times like now, however, that were making him reconsider. Not only would it be good to have someone to bounce ideas off of, there were admired a question that had to be answered today. Exactly how old was Andrew? Was he previously in any kind of trouble? What were the names of his parents, and what was their phone number? Exactly who was Andrew working for here in town, and, of course, had the runaway with no assets except his body ever hustled. Todd was just reaching into his desk when the phone rang, hoping it wasn't someone else calling about a blue cheese recall. He picked it up. WLAK, this is Todd Mills, a bright female voice said. Hi, Todd. How are you? Uh, fine. I hope I'm not calling too early. Uncomfortable with her personal tone, he hesitated then said, No. Oh, good. Um, listen, I just wanted to check in. Do you have a couple minutes? She was young, sounding, and definitely energetic. But who the hell was she? Another crackpot caller? Her voice didn't sound the least bit familiar. He asked, I'm sorry, but who is this? Oh. Uh, how stupid of me. It's me, Melissa. I'm just calling regarding your request. Uh, my request? Yes, it was faxed to me last week. Uh, sorry, it's taken me so long to get back to you. Todd stretched his mind this way and that, but he couldn't quite get a handle on it. Just as he didn't know her voice or her name, nor did he know what the hell she was talking about. Melissa said, So do you have a couple of minutes to visit with me? Well, this wasn't making any sense, and he said, I'm sorry, I'm not tracking you here. You're calling regarding the facts. She laughed in an almost too familiar way. Oh, no, no, no. Todd, I'm calling you regarding the interview with Tim Chase. They faxed me your request from Hollywood. I'm Mr. Chase's publicist. Suddenly, Melissa, who was obviously not Minnesotan at all, 
of an oh-so-casual Californian, had Todd's complete attention. He sat forward in his chair and cleared his throat. Just sound cool. Just sound collected and intelligent. She continued, saying, Didn't anyone from L.A. call to let you know I'd be in contact? Actually, no. Oh, I'm sorry. And here I'm calling out of the blue and babbling on and on. That's okay. I'm just pleased someone's calling me back. Thank you very much. Of course. It's my job, after all. Actually, I'm calling you this morning because I saw you on TV last night. You know, at 10 o'clock, nice work. Thanks, replied Todd. It's so sad, though. Was he really just a kid? Yeah. Uh, just 17. Uh, do his parents know yet? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, I don't know. Trying to get control of the conversation, Todd said. Uh, but if you saw me on TV last night, that means you must be here in town. Yeah, I am. I flew in with Tim ten days ago. In a light way and with a slight giggle, she added, I traveled just about everywhere with him. Which meant, of course, she had power. Big power. Todd had no idea if she worked for Chase or if something like a studio had, in fact, hired her to keep an eye out on one of their biggest investments. Regardless, she was obviously the gatekeeper, a purposely sweet, cheery one at that to one of the most powerful Hollywood stars. So what was this call? The nice lip down? Was she calling to tell Todd that, no, he didn't get the interview? Perhaps. And perhaps he was getting this call simply because he was part of the media and Tim Chase's keepers certainly didn't want to piss off anyone who could make ripples, however small. Uh, so, Melissa continued keeping the spotlight on Todd, what are you going to do? I mean, is there anything new on the case? Not really. Not yet. So was the kid gay? Well, the police haven't confirmed it yet. But yes, he was, replied Todd, finding it odd that she was taking such an interest. He was a teenager, and he was gay, and he was a runaway. Wow, that's sad. And now he's dead. Uh, what are you going to do next? I mean, do you have another reporter to do? Oh, yeah. One at five, and then a larger one at six. I uh, see. So, do you have to talk to the police again? I've got to talk to everyone. Uh, the police people in the apartment building. Where he lived. His friends, and hopefully his parents. This, he thought, even as he spoke, was weird. Publicists didn't keep you on the phone for seemingly no reason. They had better things to do, like press releases to write, influentials to schmooze, not to mention about a million phone calls to make. So what was going on here? As friendly and as sweet-sounding as she might pretend, Todd definitely found himself squirming. What kind of game was this? He had a distinct feeling that she'd done her homework and that she knew a good deal about him. So, could it be that instead of a thanks-but-no-thanks call, she was actually feeling about? In other words, was this an interview? It was, wasn't it? Shit, realized Todd. Could he be that close to Tim Chase? Wanting to sound as real and intelligent as possible, he quickly thought of a tax, saying, I'm sure most, if not all, the other stations will be exploiting the victim's sexuality, but I think that's too cheap. I want to keep it as personal and real as possible. From what little I do know at this point, I doubt this kid was killed simply because he was gay. Rather... I'm going to try to show how our family broke down over one particular issue and what that eventually led to. You mean like the permanent destruction of the family? Exactly. Cool, replied Melissa with such an accent that it sounded as if she was saying, cool. You know, that almost sounds like the theme to Tim's movie. You know, the good heart. The one he's filming here. Perhaps. Listen, Todd, getting to the point of why I called... Tim only likes to do one television interview per town. It just gets too competitive. Otherwise, you know who's going to run the first interview? Who's going to come up with the snappiest angle? The juiciest gossip? Let me tell you, it's a recipe for disaster. Sure, sure. So we have to be really careful about who we choose, and that means we kind of have a different process for doing these things. She paused and in a kind of bright but fake way. She asked, Am I making any sense? Todd sat there, the phone pressed firmly to his ear. 
What the hell was she saying? Did he or didn't he have the interview? Todd said, I think I'm following. Well, let me put it this way. Tim wants to meet you before we agree to anything. I see, he replied, hoping his tone didn't belie his surprise. Good. How about tonight? Tim was wondering if you could come over about nine for a glass of wine. How's that sound? Tonight okay? Nine tonight? Sounds great. Fantastic. Here, let me give you the address. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.